So first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Arseni Marinian, Senior Key Tester at Exec Pro, and I'm going to talk about software testing. So what is testing in general? Uh, generally speaking, everywhere we need to check if everything is okay. Like in these pictures, we test food like when we cook in or like we are checking ourselves at the doctor. So here is more formal definition of software testing. As you can see, it's slightly evolved all the time. Initially, it was all about running a software program with the purpose of detecting errors. But in fact, you don't always need to execute the program to find defects. The modern definition of software testing considering comparison of expect program behavior and the actual program behavior. So software testing is necessary because we all make mistakes. Some of those mistakes are important, or not important since uh, some of them could be expensive or dangerous. We need to check everything and anything we produce because things can always go wrong. Humans make mistakes all the time. So here are a few examples of how my software failure could cost. A single bug in a software could lead to significant money loss, reputation damage, or even death in some cases. So, what bug? As you can see on the right picture, there is a little bug taped to mark to computer log. Operators traced an error in the mark to to a moth tripped in a relay and documented this case with a statement, first actual case of bug being found. That's how the term bug came to software testing. So let's go back to testing itself. What do we want to achieve while testing software? What are the goals of software testing? Any thoughts? How do you think? Quality okay. assurance. Of course, yeah. It's all about quality. So, well, first of all, we need to provide some actual information about the software and the test and make sure that the customer is aware of any potential risks. It allows us to increase the confidence in the level of quality. So, and of course, testing considering highlighting the problems, the application and the test. So we're pointing out the defects and errors that were made during the development phases. So let's take a closer look at testing types. So there are several ways to break down tests into different categories. These include among others, whether it's functional or functional, white box or black box or change related. So let's take a closer look. Let's start with functional tests. Of these type of tests are allow us to evaluate if the software meets the explicit requirements of the clients. Another way to think about functional testing is that when performing it, we're expecting some very specific results. So here's a quick example. If we click button, it's supposed to open the new tab, we do expect a new tab to be opened. So it should be very clear here. In contrast to functional testing, which shows us what software does, non-functional tests show us how the software does what it does. So for example, how much time it takes to load a page or how secure or how user-friendly it is. NFT is mostly about some quality characteristics of the application. Another way to categorize test types is by how much access to the source code the testers have. For example, if we have full access to the source code, we call it white box testing. There is a benefit of such testing, we could explicitly collate the coverage and measure how much of the code is covered by our tests. We can measure statement, branch, and path coverage, and usually we have at least full statement coverage. And that basically means that all the executable statements in the source code are executed at least once. In contrast, black box testing is when we have no access to the source code at all. There are techniques which can apply specifically to black box testing. Those involve equivalence classes and boundary values analysis, for example, and it helps to divide input variables into groups based on what their own and output is. Uh, the main idea here is to minimize the number of tests and provide good coverage. For example, 
if a program is supposed to do one thing for number lower than 100 and a different thing for numbers over 100, do you, so we don't want to test every single number there. Instead, we could do, what we could do is to divide it in, into equivalence classes and test a couple of examples from each. So, for example, we could take 99, 99 100, and 101, and this will provide a coverage here. So, another way in which tests are divided is related to change in the software. Say we found a bug, reported it, and the first claim it has been fixed. What we need to do next is to retest the issue to make sure it has indeed been fixed. There is confirmation this for retesting. We might also want to run regression tests depending on what has been changed in the software. Regression testing helps us just to make sure nothing got broken while some other parts of the software got fixed. So during the whole testing process, it's very important to document our work. First, to make it more efficient and to present it to clients or colleagues and in some cases to cover our backs. So there are different types of testing documentation and each serving a specific purpose and we'll take a closer look at some of them in the slides. The first, on the first one usually created is a test plan and here we determine the test objectives to be achieved, test approach, schedule, and so on. The important thing here is to specify explicit exit criteria. That defines when we could say that we're good to the sign off. For example, there should be no bugs with high critical priorities. The next artifact is test case. A test case is a set of preconditions, inputs, actions, expected results, plus conditions. For instance, input could be five plus seven, action is click calculate button, and then the expected result will be 12. So the majority of testers work is centered around creating, maintaining, and running these test cases. Test case could have different attributes, which you can see on this slide. They may or may not have all of these, but they will definitely have test case description. It tells what we're doing and expected result, which is the description of what should happen as the result of our action. So in case if the expected result differs from the actual results, well, we do have a bug here. And of course we should properly document it. To find a bug, we should somehow communicate this to developers and it's very important to do so in a precise and effective manner or else the developers might not understand what the bug is or even worse they can misunderstand and fix in a way that worsens the situation so we need to be very clear here uh what do you think guys what bug attributes are most important any thoughts Can you repeat? Uh, so I'm checking, how do you think what bug attributes are most important? So what should we specify in order to say it's a good bug or well-documented one? Maybe cause, the reason why it happened. Uh, it's good to document as many information as you have, but in fact, uh, there are lots of different fields and all of them could be specific to a specific bug. For example, if uh, we find an issue which happens only in Chrome browser, so we need to specify this information in a test environment um, field here. So it'd be very important for this particular bug. So once we raise the bug, we need to track its state somehow. Speaking of bug tracking software, those are platforms that allow us to keep our bug reports, the status or updates on them. So as well as quickly find previously raised tickets. So you might be familiar with some of them. Let's switch to the next part. And 
let me talk a little bit about the exact pro specifics. So an exact pro, we're mostly dealing with testing of financial infrastructures. And I think all of you are familiar with banks. I'm pretty sure all of you got mobile bank applications right in your smartphones right now. But financial infrastructures includes a lot of different parties like exchanges where clients could sell and buy stuff, CSD where the information about securities is stored and so on. So since we're talking about trading, we also should think about risks and consequences. If something goes wrong, the client actually could lose money or sensitive data to also damage the reputation of the trading platform. So no one will trust it anymore. This slide could give you an idea of why testing and especially automated testing is essential for financial applications. In one day, it could process more than hundreds of millions of transactions or trades when people are selling and buying something. They're not going in sequence. There could, could be some spikes, more than 40,000 transactions per second. And the average latency on this slide basically means that if the client sends their it gets the response in 100 microseconds or even less. Furthermore, the exchange system must be available 100% of the time. So there must be no service interruptions at all. Just to illustrate the numbers. So when you blink an eye, the exchange, exchange system processes 3000 of transactions. Plane covers only two and a half centimeters and the fastest man on earth less than one millimeter. So this picture is here just to illustrate the complexity of a trading platform. And it also illustrates how our test tools could be applied for testing of such platforms. There are lots of components, so our tools are connected to cover specific parts of the system. So for example, you can see this little guy in the top left, this tool called Tailfish, and it simulates the flow between the user and application trading gateway. So we can specific trades and validate responses. We developed a bunch of tools to test specific parts of trading platform. For instance, we do have a tool called Load Injector designed for non-functional testing, which we previously covered in this presentation. To sum up, we just covered the basic aspects of software testing and highlighted some specific aspects of technical <coughs> testing financial services. And I do hope you found this presentation useful. And now I'm open for anything related to this topic. So feel free to ask me. Any questions so far? Actually, I have one. So what do you think about waterfall versus agile topic? Uh, sorry, could you please repeat your question once more? Uh, what do you think about waterfall versus agile techniques? So it's totally dependent on the project. So in some projects, it could be reliable to use waterfall, in some projects, it could be reliable to use agile techniques. So it's totally Yes, yeah, so there is no universal answer to that, right? Of course, yeah. Yeah. We can't use any universal technique. Otherwise, the world would be perfect. Thanks for the question. Any more questions? Okay, so I think we're done here. Thanks for your attention.